Horror is always a genre that has really stood out to me because I used to avoid it like the plague. I saw that thriller music video as a kid and that was more than enough for a long time. And as someone who hates roller coasters and all that, I just really did not understand the idea of enjoying being scared. Like I do that every time I try and have a conversation with someone. Why would I want to do that for fun? I can't remember what exactly it was that started getting me into horror, but it didn't take long from there for me to understand what all the fuss was about. This genre has always been pretty culturally significant. I mean, they're the ones you always see people watching in movies randomly. Even in horror movies, you see people watching Number horror seven. movies. Now I watch a lot of movies as anyone who follows me on Letterboxd would know. No, that's not a plug. And there's nothing more than I love and that feeling of being completely invested in a story where you lose track of time entirely and can do nothing but sit there without being able to take your eyes off the screen until it's over. And I love horror movies because being absolutely fucking terrified is a very good way of losing yourself in a story. Now, in that regard, horror is a lot like comedy in the way that it's all very subjective and not everyone's gonna find the same thing scary. Like, it's all very dependent on a particular person whether they'll connect with it or not. Like, some people don't like clowns or others are afraid of ghosts and then there's me who still can't touch Dia Dia Docks. If I had to pick the movie that scared me the absolute most, it would be the 2009 film Lake Mungo. Again, horror is subjective, don't bully me. I watched this one at 12 a.m. by myself in a dark room with nothing but a blanket to protect me, and at some point I became too scared to even look away and cover myself with it. I don't want to say too much about this one for fear of spoiling it for anyone, but it uses like a mockumentary style to tell a story about a grieving family retelling the supernatural events surrounding their daughter's death, and that really helped ground it in reality for me. And while it definitely won't be for everyone, the only the other time I've ever been that scared is when I first found out about taxes. And I love that. So why is that exactly? Another one that really got me was Hereditary, which I'm sure a lot more people know about. And literally the only way I was able to get through that one was because of this guy. Thank you. Now, after watching about 12,000 horror movies, I think I finally cracked the code of what people find scary. Or at least me. I think fundamentally, horror movies are able to really get under your skin with their manipulation of a fear of the unknown, which I'm fairly certain everybody has experienced at some point. Have you ever walked in the wrong classroom before? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. A lot of monster movies really understand this idea because for a majority of their running time, they'll do everything they can to hide the creature from you and only give you small glimpses until the very end. Also that it can remain something you can't comprehend, like why they're still making Saw movies. 12 years ago, I turn in a dirty <laughs> cop. It's that feeling of being chased or hunted by some indestructible or unexplainable being, something that can't be stopped and operates outside the laws of what we know how to handle, like a demon in The Exorcist, or Brightburn with a super-powered being, or The Meg with a really big shark. Silence is a key weapon of filmmakers as well. And so a lot of mass killers don't talk because that lack of communication is scary, as I'm sure many married couples are well aware. And then as we all know, the second they try and explain it to you, it becomes infinitely less scary. Like, oh, he's a dead serial killer who kills people in their dreams? Yeah, sure, I can handle that. I think there are very few horrors that have been able to maintain that fear of uncertainty as soon as they explain to you the villain's backstory. Because ultimately, it's that feeling of not knowing exactly what you're up against or where it comes from or what it once that scares us so much. One exception I can think of is Wreck, which follows a reporter tagging along with some firemen who find themselves trapped in a building infested with zombies. There's a bit right at the end where they find a lab with newspaper clippings and a recording vaguely hinting at the origin of the outbreak being the result of a possessed girl. And this is all cleverly used to not only provide you with some answers, but then also set up the final encounter, which makes you absolutely terrified of what's coming next. Oh my god, what the fuck is that thing? Oh my god, get it away! For me, horror works especially well when there are elements of being somewhat grounded in reality. Not all of them do this, obviously. But I find the ones that get to me the most are the ones that make you go, Oh, that could really happen. There's this movie Sinister that for the first two thirds scared the ever-living shit out of me because you just have no idea what you're dealing with until it's revealed to just be the work of some supernatural demon thing named Bagul. <laughs> And then it kind of just got worse from there. A lot of great movies spend time getting you familiar with the characters before unleashing some ungodly hell on them because that way it hits a lot closer to home. But not when they do that fucking based on true events garbage. I can't imagine anyone came home after watching The Conjuring and was like, oh my god, I can't believe that was real. And now for the inevitable part I'm sure you were waiting for since you can't talk about horror movies without bringing up the controversial statement that jump scares 
bad. I am sure you have heard like a million people talk about the horror genres over reliance on these things, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to do it anyway. There is nothing that can so quickly sour my enjoyment of a scary movie quite like an obnoxious jump scare. They're like a sneeze, right? And no one likes sneezing. <laughs> By this point, as soon as the horror movie goes silent, we all know what's coming. Oh, wow. Look at this spooky hole in the wall. I better go and have a look at it as slowly as possible. And oh, boy. I do sure hope nothing jumps out at me as I move away from it. It is infinitely scarier to me when something appears out of nowhere in complete silence. It feels more realistic to me and it gives you more time to be afraid and react to what it is you're seeing. One of my favorite things about horror movies is when they put spooky shit in the background that you might not even notice. It gets me every time. You'd think in like a quiet place where considering the gimmick, any natural sound at all would be enough to scare you. But even here, they feel the need to constantly barrage you with loud noises. This buildup gives you time to freak yourself out with what you're worried might be there. And that's a hell of a lot more effective to me than just, ooh, spooky. Well, sometimes they're even better without a buildup entirely and really catch you off guard, which feel a lot less cheap than the ones you knew were coming about 10 minutes ago. Don't even even get me started on fake out jump scares, okay? Which is somehow even more obnoxious. The amount of fucking times a door closes behind them or a rat comes out of nowhere, it's always a fucking rat. This is gonna be a whole tangent, I'm so sorry. Sometimes horror movies even end with jump scares just to really make sure you go home disappointed. Dude, this is darkness. Better see this trope more than accidental boob grabs in anime. Now, this is not at all to suggest there are no good jump scares. I mean, the most iconic scene from Psycho was considered to be one, and everyone loves that. And then there was that fucking scene with the painting and the conjuring too. Ah! But for a lot of people, they can be the biggest roadblock on getting into horror since they're not an enjoyable kind of scare. And I do totally get why people are turned off entirely from the genre because they're petrified of this cheap tactic. Some people hate them so much there are entire websites dedicated to telling you when jump scares are coming up. Here are two words that are enough to inspire terror on their own, horror sequels. Because of their tendency to have a lower budget, horror movies are usually super profitable and so will result in many, many sequels. Studios are even so confident of this sometimes that they'll have their killer die in some intentionally ambiguous way to cut the writers some slack when having to come up with some contrived reason as to why they survived. I kind of respect the rigorous dedication to continuing the story from the last film, which used to be necessary before they realized they can just reboot or ignore select sequels. Like guys, in the ending of the last one, the killer was shot 20 27 times in the head and then was decapitated with a chainsaw and launched into the sun and disintegrated completely. How the fuck are we going to explain why he's fine in this one? Oh no, it's okay, I got it. So it turns out they swapped their clothes with a police officer before all that happened, so they've really been fine all along. As an example, I wanted to talk about the only famous slasher franchise with like a bajillion sequels that I've actually seen all the way through. Halloween. This series gets so fucking weird the longer it goes on. In the original movie, you have a very simple story of a masked killer named Michael Myers who killed his sister when he was a kid, and now many years later is back and going on a killing spree on Halloween night. The only survivor is Laurie Strode, who in the sequel is then revealed to be Michael's sister, and then the movie ends with him being engulfed in flames and dying. Then they made Season of the Witch, which is entirely unrelated to Michael Myers since initially Halloween was supposed to be an anthology series and not just about the same guy 1200 times, and then after that one, Michael came back in Halloween 4 where it is revealed he survived the fire only to then be shot 5 million times and dropped down a hole. Then in Halloween 5 it turns out he somehow survived this fall and was nursed back to health by some random guy that Michael thanked appropriately. And this continues until Halloween 6 where it is then revealed that he is actually part of some mystical cult who want him to perform a blood sacrifice to create another Michael Myers and how the fuck did we get here? Then they made Halloween H2O which ignores everything except 1 and 2 where the movie ends with Michael being fucking decapitated only for them to then retcon this in the next Halloween movie, which I choose not to talk about. Trick or treat, motherfucker. And then they made the Rob Zombie remake and its sequel, which are their own thing. And then they made the 2018 Halloween movie, which is another reboot and ignores everything except the original. No, it's not confusing. What are you talking about? I just love the idea that the writers messed up the plot so bad that they had to restart from scratch. Twice. <laughs> With all that being said, slashes have never really been my thing, to be honest. Generally, I think a lot of people's enjoyment from them come from seeing a bunch of obnoxious characters being horrifically killed off. And maybe this is just me, but I think movies where the sole purpose is just to show people dying in horrifically gory ways are a little bit fucked up. That being said, I am really looking forward to finding out how Jason Voorhees goes from a camp to Manhattan, then to hell, and then space. And on that note, is anyone else really tired of people complaining about dumb decisions in horror movies? Like, yeah, 
okay, people make dumb choices in these things. I make stupid choices in real life too, like choosing to watch Lake Mungo at 12 a.m. But how would that be better if they were like, oh no, I'm being chased by a masked killer who has killed several of my friends who I've known for many years. I better stop and carefully plan out my next move so that the audience at home doesn't think I'm like scared for my life or anything. I don't know if that's just me, but I find that way more unlikely. Like horror is supposed to be frustrating. That's a big part of it because there's meant to be that powerlessness between the person you're rooting for and whatever malevolent force or outdated internet meme is chasing them. And that's why a lot of horror movies have that intentional power imbalance to create that sense of danger. You know, you've got a masked killer and a teenage girl, a masked killer and a teenage girl, and a masked killer and a teenage girl. Okay, come on guys. But then people are like, I wouldn't have done that. They say from their couch watching a movie in absolutely zero danger whatsoever. Anyway, where were we? Smaller budgets are good for more than just making bank though, since sometimes they can force creativity with their limitations. In real life, things that scare us aren't necessarily very elaborate, so I don't think horror movies always have to be. A great example of a super successful movie, thanks in part to its small budget, is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which while I didn't like all too much, even I can admit the film looks fucking terrifying because of the way it's filmed. It makes it look grittier and real, and that adds a lot to what makes it scary. Uh, for some people. When it comes to low budget successes, the first that always comes to mind is The Blair Witch Project, which made 250 million on a budget of like $14. I can't say this movie exactly scared the shit out of me considering that I watched it way after having the ending spoiled, but I know for a lot of people it was an absolutely terrifying experience and it achieves all this with a bunch of rocks and tree branches. A lot of what makes this movie so effective is by letting your mind fill in the blanks of what it's not showing you. I'm coming! My boots are at least! Oh my god, what the fuck is that? With all that being said, sometimes movies can be a little too ambiguous with their antagonists and then never end up fucking showing them for the entire hour and a half. Because as much as I love intentional ambiguity, I also love me some scary monsters. It Comes at Night comes to mind, which for this exact reason was hated by general audiences. Hi, I'm General Audiences. It's why found footage in general is one of my favorite ways to do horror. Yeah, I totally get why some arsehole running around with a camera for an hour and a half isn't for everyone, especially people with motion sickness, but I've never found anything that immerses me so quickly. Found footage really like forces you to be a part of the situation. And I really love that because it drags you along for the ride whether you want to or not. Of course, there's many, many other types that I'm skipping over like body horror, which preys on the very rational fear of not wanting to have a penis monster come out of your chest. There's horror comedy too, which to be honest is another one that doesn't really do all that much for me since the only time I want to be laughing at something that's also meant to be scary is if it's the pee pee poo poo man. With that being said, I still haven't seen any of the Evil Dead movies, so I should probably get on that. Another thing I really appreciate about horror specifically is their tendency to have downer endings. Usually a lot of movies stray away from this for fear of pissing off the audience, but with horror you know for sure that the people choosing to watch them already hate themselves, so it's totally fine. If anyone didn't heed the spoiler warning before, this is where I'm really getting into it, so just giving you another heads up. The first one that comes to mind for me is Eden Lake. A movie where our protagonist and Michael Fassbender are terrorized by the scariest horror villain of all, British teenagers. Do us a favor and turn the music down. Turn your sounds down. Fuck off, you prick! After a lot of stabbing, burning, and screaming, the movie ends with her finally making it to shelter, only to then discover it's actually the house of the parents who believe that she was responsible for their child's deaths. So after all that awfulness, you're finally given some kind of hope, only to then have it ripped away at the last minute. I do love me an ending that makes me feel like complete shit. There's The Mist, obviously, with its very famous ending, featuring probably one of the biggest bra moments in all of cinema. The ending of Sleepaway Camp made the whole movie for me, because after having to endure the torture that was the movie, it really surprises you at the end with this incredibly chilling shot, and leaves its final scare as the very last thing you see. I don't know, that one really got to me. I thought Get Out was going to take the same route as well, since our protagonist is left looking a little bit suspicious after breaking up with his girlfriend, but it instead went for a happier ending, which is cool too, I mean the guy deserves it. In saying that though, there is absolutely nothing wrong with doing a happy ending, for God's sake. I swear to God, if I have to see one more of those fucking bullshit cliffhanger ending things. Anyway, that was my very long spiel about why I've started to love horror movies. It obviously goes without saying that there's absolutely nothing wrong with being too afraid to watch any of them or just not being into the genre at all. That used to be me as well, but I have to admit this once seemingly terrifying section of film eventually won me over. My advice to anyone who got through this entire video without being a fan of horror at all, maybe give them a try one day. You might even start to enjoy them like I did, but not horror games. I'm not going anywhere near those.
Uh, special thanks as always to my top patrons for the month. Alex the Sandwich, Dale, Ender Pigman 9, Jake, Middle Run 1, Nightcore Games, Pineapple Monster, Primal, Scout with a Name, Sergio, and Wulu. And I'll see you all next time in your nightmares.